and welcome to Tell Us Science Museum and Lunch and Learn. I'm David Dundee, Director of Education, and I'm so glad you've uh, chosen to be with us today. Um, I just wanted to let you know that our uh, presentation today is being partially sponsored by uh, Courtyard of Marriott at Cartersville and also Century Bank. We've got some exciting things coming up at TELUS. In fact, February, uh, we have uh, a whole week of, of activities for members uh, during the, the week of February the 15th. Uh, we'll also have activities in our Great Hall Monday through Friday uh, honoring the uh, landing of the Perseverance spacecraft on Mars, which lands uh, on uh, the uh, 18th of, of uh, February, that Thursday. So uh, you might want to be ready for that. And um, also, uh, we have got uh, uh, the, the next uh, Ask the Expert will be on February the 10th. Uh, we'll have a whole session on microscopy, and Julian Gray will be here talking about microscopes. And uh, then our next uh, uh, Lunch and Learn, uh, which will be on February the 17th, uh, we'll have yet another NASA ambassador coming our way uh, to talk about the Perseverance spacecraft and the upcoming landing on Mars. So exciting things happening at TELUS all the time. Tune into our website. You can see all the exciting things going on here at the museum. And today our exciting event is we have the honor of having Chris Thompson here. He is our, uh, I guess, our senior uh, NASA Solar System Ambassador. And he has been kind enough to be at the museum for all sorts of great events from Build and Blast to other astronomy events. And today uh, we're talking about the heroes in, in uh, NASA who gave their lives to the exploration uh, of space. So take it away, Chris. cemented that legacy even further. Start over. Okay. Sorry, we had a little little glitch. We're starting from the top. All right. So my name is Chris Thompson. I'm a NASA Solar System Ambassador, and we'll talk about the NASA Day of Remembrance. In the history of NASA, the agency's highlight reel is long and distinguished. We put the first American in orbit with Alan Shepard. Uh, following that, John Glenn, or sorry, Alan Shepard was the first American in space, John Glenn the first American in orbit. The first person to fly twice, Gordon Cooper. We had the first rendezvous and subsequently the first docking. NASA is the only agency to put people outside of low Earth orbit, in fact, the only one to land people on the moon, and we did that six times. We've flown uh, 346 people in space, and the Russians have flown 125. We've had the shuttle, a magnificent vehicle that for over 30 years took crews and hardware into space. We were able to fly uh, spacewalks with untethered vehicles. We built a space station with international cooperation. 
Unmanned missions have taken NASA's legacy even further. So things like the Hubble Space Telescope and the other great observatories. The OSIRIS-REx mission that's going to return the largest sample cache to Earth of extraterrestrial material since 1972. And as David mentioned, we've got Curiosity on Mars right now, and shortly we'll have Perseverance, extending Curiosity's investigation of whether life could exist to actually whether life did exist on Mars. So we've got a lot to look back on and be proud of. However, NASA's got several tragedies on its record as well. If you look on the upper left, there's an X-15 crash that killed Mike Adams. The bottom left, the prime crew of Gemini 9, Elliot C. and Charlie Bassett, killed in a T-38 crash. In the middle, C.C. Williams, and on the right, Ted Freeman, two other astronauts who were killed in T-38 crashes. It's the lessons from these tragedies that NASA's Day of Remembrance seeks to teach and the crews of these missions that NASA seeks to memorialize. Now, the Day of Remembrance is sponsored by the Astronaut Memorial Foundation. The AMF began in 1986 after the Challenger accident. The Space Mirror, a memorial to fallen astronauts, is backlit by the sun through the granite panels. That was dedicated in 1991. This year, NASA's Day of Remembrance is tomorrow, January 28th. It's the 35th anniversary of the Space Shuttle Challenger accident. Now, NASA remembers the crews of Apollo 1, Challenger, and Columbia at the end of January every year. And the reason is because although those tragedies occurred in separate decades, 1967 for this crew, 1986 for Challenger, and 2003 for Columbia, those accidents all took place in less than a calendar week between January 27th and February 1st. Now, these three tragedies claimed the lives of 17 people. NASA changed its procedures and culture as a result of these accidents. And NASA is determined to learn from these accidents and to use that knowledge to prevent accidents in the future. Now, many positive changes have occurred, but spaceflight is still an extremely dangerous undertaking. And accidents will still happen, but the lessons learned from these tragedies will reduce the probability and severity. Now, every year, the NASA administrator puts out a message to, to the United States. And I'll read briefly some segments from Administrator Bridenstine's message of 2020. Each year at this time, the NASA community pauses on this day of remembrance to honor the brave women and men who lost their lives for the most noble of goals, the pursuit of truth and greater understanding. Today, we remember the crews of Apollo 1, Challenger, and Columbia, as well as those who surrendered all in support of missions of exploration and discovery. Our expressions of gratitude for their sacrifice cannot retract the overwhelming pain of their loss, but perhaps our efforts can further propel forward the purpose for which they gave their lives. Now, NASA's Day of Remembrance gives us all an opportunity to thoughtfully reflect on the lessons of the past and on the lives of those who dared slip the bonds of Earth and reach for greater heights. Space exploration holds many rewards as well as countless unforgiving danger. And unfortunately, NASA learned through sad experience the high price that spaceflight demands for mistakes and failures. Each of these tragedies has changed NASA. The lessons we learn from them influence everything we do today, ensuring the sacrifices of the fallen will never be forgotten. Now, as messages go on to, to explain more in more detail, some of the detailed changes that take place, and again, offering words of hope and inspiration for how we can use those lessons to improve our opportunities in the future. Taking a closer look at each of these accidents in more detail, we'll start with Apollo 1. This is the crew, Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee. Now, Grissom is already a national hero. He flew on a Gemini mission as well as, the, as an early Mercury suborbital flight. Ed White did the first American spacewalk, and Roger Chaffee, a space rookie, rounded out that crew. Their mission was to check out the Apollo spacecraft in low Earth orbit. This is their patch, showing an American flag, the names of the crew and the mission, and in the center, the Apollo spacecraft, orbiting over Florida, where it would launch from, and in the distance, the destination, not for this flight, but for future flights. So they were aiming at how to prove the Apollo spacecraft and get it ready for its ultimate mission, achieving President Kennedy's goal of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. Unfortunately, as the crew was preparing, they found a number of def defects in the spacecraft. It's, it's legendary that Gus actually hung a lemon on the spacecraft complaining about manufacturing, 
the the quality of the engineering, the equipment. It was it was a spacecraft that had a number of significant issues. In January of 1967, just weeks before the the expected liftoff, the crew was doing what's called a plugs out test on the launch pad in Florida. They had all three crew members strapped in, ready to go. And while they were working, a spark set off a, a fire inside the capsule. Now that fire quickly consumed all the oxygen and asphyxiated the crew, killing all three astronauts. It was a tragic event. This is the aftermath of the fire. Uh, there were a lot of things that went wrong that day, but NASA is determined to learn from those, uh, improve the spacecraft, and get back on its feet. Here at the Telus Science Museum, we have an artifact that captures the spirit of the times of that, that accident. This exhibit came from the, uh, the uh, HBO special from the Earth to the Moon, and this is a look at the actual exhibit looking into the panel. There's a picture that shows on the left the, the rear of the spacecraft with the plaque that uh, illustrates how we arrived or how that spacecraft arrived here. And the front of it showing the crew, the insides of the pic picture, and then uh, a cutaway of what the actual capsule looks like. So that's on display here, and I would encourage you guys to come in and take a closer look at that to really reflect on that crew and what they accomplished. After the accident, a board was set up to investigate it and understand what went wrong and how to address it. Some of the fixes that came out of it will seem almost laughable now when you when you realize that they weren't in place at the time this took this accident took place things like emergency oxygen masks for ground crew and even on board fire extinguishers protection panels that could isolate fires ports inside of, of panels that would allow targeted application of firefighting materials those things that we take for granted today just didn't exist in 1967 the hatch that enclosed the crew was bolted on and opened inward. The hatch was redesigned so that it was opened in less than 10 seconds and opened outward. Cabin atmosphere. On the ground, this crew was in a highly pressurized, pure oxygen environment, over 16 PSI, which made it an extremely flammable environment. Future crews worked with a 60% oxygen, 40% nitrogen mix at just over uh, atmospheric pressure to ensure we could test the spacecraft's pressure capability, but not put the crew at risk. We had flammable materials inside the spacecraft, nylon, polyurethane, silicone, uh, lots of Velcro, and that was highly flammable, especially in a pressurized oxygen environment. Took all that out and replaced it with Teflon, glass, aluminum, stainless steel, and beta cloth. The wiring harnesses, that miles of wiring throughout an Apollo spacecraft, including inside the command module. The contractors built those on flat surfaces even though they understood that those wiring harnesses would need to go up, down, sideways, left, and right, so they would be better built in a 3D harness and not just flat on a table. So lots of changes had to be made in the engineering, but even more so than the engineering. It's the process that we needed to look at. So things like NASA's safety culture, it, it sometimes takes a disaster to be a wake-up call that things have to change. If you're not willing to look hard into these difficult situations and learn from them, we can't improve. So if we do take that hard look, we can never repeat mistakes that we once made. Things like procedures being subject to last minute changes and not being tracked or, or even communicated. Poor morale or process discipline in the manufacture of a spacecraft. That's, uh, that can't happen when you're building something that, that people's lives are gonna depend on. Understanding that as processes change, you've got to be flexible in what you're, you're building. The flammables in the capsule are just one example. There's another serious discussion taking place uh, in 1967 of whether Deke Slayton should be inside that capsule as that crew went through the plugs out test. Deke was going to lay on the base of the capsule underneath the crew couches and observe. If he'd have been in there, he would have been killed in the accident as well. The test procedures underestimated the danger of a 100% overpressure oxygen environment. Clearly, they, they, uh, they thought they were doing the right thing. They pressed ahead with the process. But in their zeal to um, meet President Kennedy's national goal of reaching the moon, um, in the zeal of pushing for our proof that we were technologically superior to the Russians and by extension ideologically superior, we became blind to these risks in pursuit of those objectives. After the fire, the redesigned Apollo spacecraft was a much better vehicle. 
without this tragedy, we may well have not landed on the moon at all, much less in 1969. The fact that we landed on the moon is in large part due to the sacrifices of these three men. To honor them, at the site where they died, Launch Complex 34, the gantry was removed after the flight of Apollo 7, and all that's left today is a steel base, steel and concrete base. On one of those legs of the base rests this plaque that, that recognizes on January 27, 1967, these three crew members were killed. And at the bottom, the inscription reads, they gave their lives in service to their country in the ongoing exploration of humankind's final frontier. Remember them, not for how they died, but for those ideals for which they lived. Moving on to the next mission in the, in the week uh, for remembrance is Challenger, STS-51L, that lifted off January 28, 1986. The crew, front row here, left to right, Mike Smith, Commander Dick Covey, or Dick, Dick Scobie, rather, and on the right, Ron McNair. In the back row, Elon Azuka, Krista McAuliffe, Greg Jarvis, and Judy Resnick. Their mission was to deploy a TDRA satellite, something we take for granted today is continuous communications in, in and through space. In 1986, we had one TDRA satellite that allowed communications to come down from the ground. We didn't have continuous coverage. This crew was bringing a second satellite, tracking and data relay satellite, but also science objectives, the Spartan Halley satellite to, to study Comet Halley and also the teacher in space lessons that Krista McAuliffe was going to teach. Now, we all know that 73 seconds after liftoff, the vehicle came apart as a result of O-rings not sealing the solid rocket boosters. The exhaust plume from that leak cut the solid rocket booster support strut and pivoted the SRB into the external tank, rupturing it and burning all of that fuel at once. At launch, it looked like this. There's two pictures, the one on the left showing the icicles. The temperature at launch was 38 degrees. It was freezing overnight. And on the right, you see the puff of black smoke coming out of the, the aft field joint on the solid rocket booster. Once the engineers saw that, they knew exactly what had happened. The gases escaped through the O-ring seals and came out through a hole in the side of the booster, enlarging that hole as more gas and flame escaped. If, that's, if the point at which that hole opened up was not pointed at the strut that mounted the SRB to the external tank, that booster may not have pivoted into the tank, destroying it. It might not have reached orbit, but it may not have, it may not have ruptured the tank and, and killed the crew. But that's what happened. The tank ruptured. The resulting aerodynamic loads on the orbiter broke it apart. And the crew cabin impacted the Atlantic Ocean at over 200 miles an hour. This is the scene in an iconic photo. The solid rocket boosters are spreading away from, from the fireball caused by the external tank, and the, the orbiter is actually broken apart by those forces. And, and there's pieces of the orbiter that you see spreading out from the fireball. The lessons learned and changes at NASA because of 51L include the Challenger Commission issuing a lengthy report on the accident, its causes and recommendations to address them. A lot of it was pretty straightforward. Fix the solid rocket booster joint, uh, get an independent overstructure or, or review of, of the redesign process, changing Nana, NASA's management culture, creating a safety organization. There was not a separate safety organization within NASA at the time. And reviewing top to bottom, every critical item on the shuttle and making sure that it was designed properly. Other recommendations were less obvious. There were lots of changes at the Marshall Space Flight Center, the center itself responsible for solid rocket boosters, improving landing safety for future shuttle missions, something not even contemplated as a cause of Challenger, but recognized as a critical element to redesign. Nose wheel steering, more, more powerful brakes, and eventually a landing parachute. A crew escape system, maintenance and spare parts changes, and stopping the practice of removing parts off of one orbiter and putting them on another to maintain flight rate. Other changes were in the management structure, changing the flight rate, moving payloads off the space shuttle, changing astronaut duties from repairing satellites to, to microgravity research, to assembly research, to getting the space station started. That was really the focus at that time. 
a lot of rules were put in place to manage the decision-making process, and if you want a, a good recitation of that, watch the Netflix documentary Challenger, The Final Flight, that came out last year. It's four episodes. It's a really good, uh, not groundbreaking news, but a, a very good depiction of the events that occurred at the time and a, and a good overview of, of the crew. It gives them a, a much more personalized feel. At the time, we thought flying civilians in space was going to be the way to go and, and make space available for everyone, like Krista McAuliffe. It was 22 years before another private citizen flew on a U.S. space shuttle, and that was Barbara McAuliffe. Or Bar sorry, Barbara Morgan, Krista McAuliffe's backup. She became an astronaut in 1998 and flew in 2007. We heard the phrase normalization of deviance for the first time, and that's the idea that when you do things wrong long enough, after a while it seems like it's the right way, but it's not. And when deviance from the right procedure gets normalized, people get hurt. So we have to be diligent about following procedures. There's a reason they're put in place before the events take place. That way you know what to do as it occurs. Now, on the real positive side, I think um, one of the lasting legacies of Challenger is the, the Challenger Centers. Now, there are 38 Challenger Centers, mostly in the U.S., but some internationally, and there are some in this region. So we have one in Columbus, Georgia, Columbia, South Carolina, Chattanooga, Tennessee, and those are great places for people not only to remember the crew, but for students to learn lessons about how to work cooperatively together and accomplish great things. The third was the Columbia accident in 2003. Columbia lifted off January 16th, 2003 for a microgravity research mission. This crew, uh, Rick Husband on the left, Kalpanachana in the middle, and Willie McCool, what a great name for a pilot. Willie McCool on the right, Dave Brown, Laurel Clark, Mike Anders, uh, Anderson, and Israeli fighter pilot, Elon Ramon in the back. This crew flew a microgravity research mission they were doing wonderful work. They had no idea, no idea that just seconds after their launch in an eerily familiar frame, debris came off of the bipod area, which is the mount, uh, the front mount for the shuttle attached to the external tank. It's covered with insulation and a briefcase sized piece of foam broke off, came down and struck the reinforced carbon carbon of the front edge of that wing. Most engineers thought that foam wouldn't do any damage, but it actually cracked the reinforced carbon carbon opening up a hole through which heat could reenter, heat could get into the wing during reentry. We had the opportunity to use the United States Department of Defense assets to take photographs of the shuttle in orbit. We actually did that on STS-1 when they noticed tiles that were missing. Lots of people didn't know about that. It was really secret at the time and only recently came out that we used DOD assets to take pictures of the shuttle in space. They could have done that for Columbia and chose not to, again, because the experts told them there's not going to be a problem. But as that heat entered the wing, melted the aluminum, the shuttle wing broke off, the cabin crew broke apart and depressurized, 200,000 feet over Texas, and that killed all seven members of the crew. The lessons learned at NASA as a result of 107 directly led to retiring the space shuttle and going with commercial crew as, as uh, America's approach to putting crews in space. We went back and dusted off the lessons of Challenger, and many of the things that were recommended for Challenger were recommended to fix problems from the Columbia accident. We did put more cameras in place and do much more uh, advanced uh, observations of the shuttle during ascent, but that's after the fact. If the shuttle's already lifted off, whatever's going to happen, all we're going to have is information about what happened and very little way to fix it. They did include a long boom that would sit on the opposite side of the robot arm in the, in the payload bay, and that was used to be able to reach out with the robot arm and put a, a long camera extension, kind of like a selfie stick for the sh shuttle orbiter and be able to look underneath the orbiter at the condition of the tiles after launch. So they did a lot of inspection. But again, you're, you're using payload capability to inspect a vehicle that's already la launched and not doing anything to prevent it, or not doing as much to prevent it. Now, one major change was that after Columbia flew, the rest of the shuttle flights, save one, 
only went to the space station so that if there was a problem with the orbiter, the crew would have a safe place to stay until a rescue mission could be mounted. The only exception to that was STS-125 that went to the Hubble Space Telescope and did a repair of that um, great observatory. Again, this is the crew from 107. NASA has put in place a program called the Apollo Challenger Columbia Lessons Learned Program. And the director of that program is Mike Cianelli. And he summarized the, the goals of that with just four bullet points. Number one, when you see something, say something. Does that sound familiar? And too often we remain silent because we're uncertain what our input's gonna be received at. And we always think somebody else is gonna speak up. You can't let that happen. If you see something, you've gotta bring it up in order to get it addressed. Second bullet point, expert opinions are just that, they're opinions. We tend to trust authority, especially when it lifts responsibility off of our shoulders. But sometimes the best thing to do is to admit we don't know and then really search for what that answer is. And the third, watch out for the normalization of deviance. I already talked about that. But when we're doing something the wrong way and it becomes so common that everybody thinks it's the right way, people are gonna get hurt. Mom's advice was really good. Just because everybody else jumps off a bridge doesn't mean you should. Mike's last lesson that he wants to pass on is something that everybody can implement, whether you're an astronaut or a parent trying to teach your children. Follow NASA's example and learn from our failures. Everybody makes mistakes, but repeated failure is not an option. NASA has become more open with uh, the details of these accidents. And a few years ago, created this exhibit called Forever Remembered. For a long time, the debris from Apollo 1 Challenger in Columbia was never seen in public. But recently, this exhibit, Forever Remembered, highlights pieces of debris from the orbiters and even the hatch from Apollo 1. It also includes individual uh, memorials for each of the astronauts killed in the missions. It has personal effects, tells their story, makes them um, humanized, where people can go and reflect on the, the lives that these individuals led and the mission that they followed. And a, a flight director who used to be an astronaut posted this picture on Twitter with the screens in mission control with pictures of each of the crews and a quotation by Gene Krantz that reminds the flight directors how important their role is um, in dealing with uh, with these kind of accidents and how they can work towards preventing them. So there's a lot of things that have changed. If you want to follow up for some more information, there's a couple of great NASA podcasts. One's called Small Leaps, Giant Steps, and there's the URL to, to listen to that one, and that's Mike Cianelli, and he also appears on one called The Rocket Ranch. And this is the, the season during which NASA's reflecting, so he's, he was uh, asked to appear on both of those podcasts. It's not the same message. Uh, he, it's two different two different podcasts and, and uh, his program is the same, but two good ways to listen to what Mike has to say. This year, the Day of Remembrance is tomorrow, the 35th anniversary of Challenger. It will be a, a closed door event, if you will. It's uh, private, only a few people invited. There'll be one at Arlington National Cemetery, as well as in Florida at the Space Mirror. They will be live streamed and they will have, have social distancing and everything else, but it will be an opportunity to participate remotely in NASA's Day of Remembrance, um, where you'll see, this is Ed White III touching the, the name plaque for his father. On a personal note, I wanted to recognize our own, uh, the Meteorite Association of Georgia, our own Day of Remembrance for two individuals we recently lost. The picture on the left is Dave Giesling and Sven Buell in the Atacama Desert hunting for meteorites. Dave passed in November of, of 2020. And on the right, his father, Barry, who just recently, just this month, passed as well. So Dave Giesling and Barry Giesling, we're going to miss you both. Well, uh, Chris... Uh... I just wanted to finish with one thought there, David, and that's on this day, not on any day, not just NASA's Day of Remembrance, we should recommit ourselves to the ideals for which these brave crews of Apollo 1, Challenger, and Columbia lived. We need to remember the past, even especially the painful parts. If we can learn from those painful parts, we'll be able to um, learn those lessons, learn from them, and use those lessons to improve our and our children's future. Thank you very much for attending. Well, uh, Chris, before we... Uh... We wind up. I, I do have some questions from our uh, audience out there. 
And uh, Charles Ann asks, uh, how does the crew from the from the shuttle, uh, how does the escape system actually work for the for the crew? Well, in theory, what the shuttle escape system that was installed after the Challenger accident would do is it provided a long pole which would um, guide the astronauts out to avoid hitting the wing. The initial tests of just jumping out of the shuttle showed that, that there was a pretty high likelihood they would hit the orbiter. So a pole would extend out and curve down. The astronaut would hook a lanyard to that pole that would then guide them below the slipstream of the shuttle and allow them to miss the wing. Um, there was a lot of weight associated with that system. The parachutes themselves weighed over 60 pounds. It was only usable in certain regimes of flight. They had to be in level flight. They had to be going slow enough to be able to get out. Um, there were only a couple of instances in which that escape system would have been impossible to use. It would not have saved the Columbia crew. In fact, astronaut Mike Mullane in his book, Riding Rockets, described the escape system as busy work while dying. Um, Eddie asks, uh, the man, man space flight cost is about 10 times of, of any robotic missions. How do we justify the extra expense in, in dollars and lives uh, with the new AI capability and computers and robotics? Um, uh, robotic missions uh, uh, probably are more necessary than manned missions. Oh, I think there's a place for both. If you're going to send a spacecraft to Pluto or to Titan, uh, you know, it's it's you're sending a robot. We can't send people that far. If you're sending a mission to go into Earth observation and do uh, just over and over the same observation for years at a time, you send a robot. If you're going to Mars to explore whether the environment was habitable and could have sustained life, you send a robot. But that robot at Mars faces some considerable challenges. The time delay and the uh, capabilities, even of advanced AI, and I'll give you that it's improving day, day, every day, still require that commands be sent to the rover through a, an orbiting satellite. There's only a few opportunities to downlink to that individual rover. Then those commands are executed. That rover can't operate autonomously because it's there's hazards that pop up along the way. So it takes a lot more time to send actuate, receive messages from Mars or any distant location that a person on the ground has the ability to adapt to very quickly. Uh, a ge human geologist would be able to cover much more ground than a robot geologist would, although the robot geologist could do it for a much longer period of time. So each of those approaches has its place and we're being judicious about how we do it. We're planning much more robotic exploration, and eventually we'll put people back um, to the moon and, um, with any luck, onto Mars. So uh, Charles Ann follows up her first question with, uh, so it's kind of like an escape system for commercial uh, airline pilots. I don't know of any commercial airliner that would allow pilots to jump out and leave the passengers on the plane. So uh, <laughs> I got you there. But there Maybe was an, an escape plane. system. <laughs> <laughs> there was an escape system on the early shuttle missions. So the first four did have ejection seats. But that was when they were flying crews that were small enough to all fit on the upper flight deck. Once they started putting crews in the mid deck, again, you take the ejection seats out. You don't want to be riding on a vehicle where the crew can get out, but you're on. you're still on board. So. And so how will the new Artemis rockets and uh, the new mission to the moon differ from the Apollo missions? Well, the, the vehicles are going to have appearances that look similar because the, the shape and size and, and mass of the vehicles will be comparable. Artemis and, and the, the Orion vehicle are lar larger than, than Apollo, so it will be able to carry more people and more mass. It's going to have uh, it more... Uh, Anal or more digital controls and not analog controls. So all the switches and dials that you saw on Apollo are going to disappear. Think of it as comparing uh, the SpaceX Dragon to an Apollo spacecraft. The, the Dragon operates with touch screens and, and pan, flat panels, whereas Apollo had lots and lots of wiring switches, heavy equipment. We can, we can improve our payload capability by reducing the amount of structure needed for the vehicle. So this time we're going not just to plant a flag, take some pictures, pull some rocks home. We're going for extended periods of time. So we need vehicles that are able to carry more payload, 
able to set up shop on the moon surface and operate there for weeks at a time, not just a couple of days. So we'll be we'll be flying more capable vehicles and uh, and operating from a, uh, a lunar orbit system that has a basically a small space station in lunar orbit, allowing those crews to stay at that location longer as well. So the whole distance, uh, uh, the distance is the same, but the ability of the crew to stay there for longer periods of time is greatly enhanced. And the timetable for the next uh, astronauts heading towards the moon? Uh, we'll be flying an unmanned SLS, hopefully this year. Uh, we'll be flying a crewed Artemis to the lunar orbit in 2024, we hope. We, the intent is to land the first American woman and the next man in 2024. We'll have to see how the new administration handles budget and what delays that the uh, the recent green run and the test of the, uh, S the uh, engines on the bottom of the SLS, uh, how that's going to play out before we really know. So NASA's expecting 2024. Uh, keep your eye on SpaceX, though. <laughs> and so the Artemis test wasn't 100% uh, uh, successful, was it? It was not 100% successful, but NASA's evaluating the data to see if there was enough success through that that they don't need to redo it um, in in Florida. The, the test shut down prematurely due to uh, a very conservative setting on one of the engine mounts so that uh, there was some vibration and process that took place that exceeded those conservative limits. It was not a structural failure, failure of the vehicle. The vehicle did exactly what it was programmed to do. So if I hearken back to that uh, earlier question about when is robot good and one is a human good. Uh, the robots shut it down early. Um, there are examples within NASA of human crew overriding robots. Uh, the, the launch of Gemini 6, for example, when the engines lit, but the crew on board decided not to eject, uh, they made the right call and saved the rocket. Uh, so again, there, there are things that a, a computer can do really well. And there are things when it's just really good to have a crew man there to make a decision real time. <laughs> Well, thank you, Chris. Thank you for your time today, and thanks all of you out there in our viewing land for uh, taking a look at our Lunch and Learn today, and I uh, hope to see you here uh, tuning in again to our next uh, broadcast from TELUS. Thank you so much.